Hello and welcome everyone to the UFC Fight Night Watterson vs. Hill Virtual Media Day. UFC Fight Night Watterson vs. Hill takes place this Saturday, September 12th at UFC Apex in Las Vegas with all bouts exclusively on ESPN+. Beginning with the prelims at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, and the main card at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Today's event will begin shortly. As a reminder, this is being recorded. Please remember to select the hand icon in the bottom right corner of your screen if you wish to ask questions, and we will unmute you. Select the hand icon again when you are finished asking, or to be removed from the queue. We will kick things off momentarily with UFC Women's Flyweight, Andrea Lee.
We now welcome the number nine ranked UFC women's flyweight in the world, Andrea Lee. Hello. Hi, Andrea. We will Hi. take the first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Good morning, Andrea. How are you doing? Hey, Gabriel. I'm doing good. So I see you rocking the cowboy hat. Important question. I saw you showing off on social media. Did you get some new ones for fight week? <laughs> I did. Of course, I can't wear them for fight week. They have a, a little logo, like a little horseshoe. So unfortunately, you know, I can't wear this um, for cameras purposes. But I did get some new hats and I'm excited about them. I love them. Congratulations. Um, recently, your boyfriend, Tony Kelly, was signed to the UFC. How motivating was it to see him make his debut? And now you guys got that whole MMA power couple thing going on. <laughs> Well, I was really excited about it. Like, I mean, he went out there and he impressed me and everyone else. I've always known what he's capable of. I've known him for, you know, 10 plus years. And, um, you know, just seeing him go out there and do his thing and have his dream, like, come true, like, is, it is, it's very inspiring. And, and to see him come back the way that he did and the way he mixed up everything, like, is striking his elbows, like, it is inspiring, you know? And it, it, it makes me want to go out there and split someone open. <laughs> It's funny, I'm, and I'm excited about it, you know, I'm, I think it's pretty awesome, you know, that we're both in the UFC. Gotcha, gotcha. I saw you're training a bit with Aspen Ladd, I mean, not obviously with her because she's injured, but the team in California. You're from Louisiana, can you just talk about that added benefit of working with that team in California? Um, well, everyone knows I do go back and forth between Gladiators and MMA Gold. Gladiators in Lafayette and then MMA Gold in California. So I did split my camp up that way. Um, and going out to train with um, MMA Gold, you know, Aspen and Jim West, like it's it's great because, you know, I'm able to like get away. I'm able to disconnect. It's beautiful up there. And I actually got to stay with Aspen in her new cabin in the mountains. So it sounds like, a, you know, it was, well, I mean, it's definitely a dream home. And it's just nice to be able to get out there, reconnect with nature, and just kind of like relax and focus on my camp. And I think that's what I really needed the most for this fight. And I think that's what I need for every camp, you know, like it, it we didn't even have that much signal up there in, in the mountains. So, you know, I can't really be on social media as much, you know, <laughs> it was good. I loved it, you know, and the training quality is amazing. You know, they schedule everything, you know, to, to work around me and what it is that I need to do and how I'm game planning. Like all the coaches are on the same like playing field and you know, we, we all work together and it, you know, I feel like I've had a really great camp. I feel good. Yeah, I saw on IG you guys got a lot of hiking in while you guys were up there. Um, <laughs> I do have a question because I think a lot of people saw you be very entertained by Roxanne's trash talk, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about what it's like to fight somebody that you are friendly with as opposed to, you know, maybe other opponents, you know, you don't know them as well. You could be a little more indifferent and focus more on the competition. Uh, well, the trash talking was hilarious. Yes, um, I enjoyed watching that. Um, you know, even the first time that, that Roxy and I fought, she made light of the situation. You know, she uh, kind of uh, she, she said, let's get dangerous, you know, and like had the whole darkling duck thing. And anyways, it was funny. It was cute. Um, you know, that's just Roxy. That's just how she is. I think it, it, do, it doesn't like take away from, you know, what we are going to do. You know, we're going to go in there and we're going to fight and we're going to put on an incredible performance for everyone. You know, business is business. Um, you know, we were able to like, you know, put our relationships, our friendships aside, you know, and do what we got to do. Um, it is, I guess it is, I don't know, I guess it, it, maybe it makes fight week a little bit easier, you know, cause you, you don't have all the butterflies, maybe. Um, I just feel really good about this fight, you know, I'm excited to be here and, um, you know, I, I like not having, like, I'm not a trash talker, so it's, it's, I like, I like this, you know, neither one of us, you know, feel any 
ill will towards the other. We don't have any animosity towards each other. You know, I like this. Uh, Sorry, that was a long response. <laughs> no, it was great. Um, my final question with the shakeup, with the main event and everything, your fight has a lot more attention going into Saturday. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, I think for a lot of people, if you get the win, this really does bounce you forward even more because of all the attention that you would get as opposed to before. Well, that's what I want. You know, I want to get, I want to be bounced forward. You know, I need that. So I don't, I don't really know where it's going to put me in the ranks, but like, I'm, I'm, you know, excited about going out there and getting this win. Um, you know, I need to get, I need to get the ball rolling. I need to get, get back on climbing the ladder and um you know i'm on a two fight skid streak so I'm, I'm here to get this win and um you know i want to do it in a um and i want to impress everyone you know and uh doing it doing it in style you know go out there get a finish or just be super aggressive and just you know when i don't necessarily want fight of the night but i would love to get a fight bonus if fight of the night is what i get Fight of the night normally means you go the distance. You know, I'm fine with that. You know, I'll, it's going to be an exciting fight, but I would love to get like a performance bonus, like some sort of a finish. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Andrea. Best of luck. Thank you, Gabe. And we will take our next set of questions from Gavin Porter with UFC.com. Which is just me, but you can still look at the camera right Okay, cool. Perfect. So it, it's got to be frustrating, right, um, to come out on two split straight split decisions when you look back at those two fights and you do you just get frustrated or how do you grow from that mentally and kind of learn more about yourself over this last year it's been tough well looking back on those fights it is it, I, I do get frustrated about it because I just think about the where I messed up but that's the learning process of everything you know that's that's what's going to make you better going into your next fight your next competition so I look back I know where I messed up and I think that's that's what's going to help me in the long run. You know, I, I was, I don't think I was on like a five fight win streak. You know, it'd been a few years since I'd lost. And, um, you know, maybe maybe losing these two fights, you know, will, you know, help help propel me in a way. You know, I think it's going to, because I don't want to, I don't want to get cut from the UFC. I, you know, so I mean, it's definitely making me fight even harder, you know, to earn my spot in the top rankings. And when you lose two really close fights like that does that add more fuel to the fire do you feel like there's a little bit more urgency when you're going through camp when you're going through your preparation for for this upcoming belt most definitely um you know it makes me every day it makes me push a little bit harder and um you know my conditioning i mean i've i've pushed it you know i feel like i've gone I've, i'm still pushing it you know I, I still feel like i haven't done enough i know i have um, and I feel great, but it's like, I still feel like every day is another day to, to continue to push and to get a little bit better, you know, and, and I'm trying to like, I'm, I'm like, you know, today, today's still a learning day. Today's still a day that I can get better, even though weigh-ins is tomorrow and the fight's on Saturday. Like, I'm still, I'm still pushing myself. As you've been pushing yourself, is there a point during, you know, this preparation of this camp where you felt, oh, it's starting to click. I'm starting to really feel it. I'm starting to get, get going in the direction I really need to be. Yes, actually, like um, two and a half weeks ago, you know, I started feeling great about everything, um, you know, just kind of getting back into the, I mean, I've been training even through all this quarantine and stuff. I've been, I've been doing things, but like once fight camp started off, you know, you're, you're getting back into the swing of, of things and that grind, um, you know, it's easy to get in your head, you know, about some things like maybe my, my, you know, my explosiveness isn't there and like my kicks aren't firing off, my punches aren't sharp enough, you know, and that's like, it's irritating, it's frustrating, but I feel like in the last couple of weeks, everything has pretty much like just, you know, panned out, everything's going smooth, I feel great. Great, thank you. And we will take our next set of questions from Danny Segura with MMA Junkie. Yeah, sorry if I'm uh, might repeat uh, a couple of questions. I uh, I missed the the beginning set of questions. Um, this is the the first time that uh, that you're getting uh, the chance to sort of avenge a a loss here because obviously you, you fought against um, Roxanne before. Um, is that nice or do you kind of treat it just as another fight? It's it's nice, but I'm still treating it like another fight. Um, you know, I don't really feel like I'm going out there to avenge anything. 
you know, um, cause that was so long ago, but it's exciting to be able to like rematch, uh, with Roxy and, um, you know, go out there and, you know, show how much better I've gotten since then. Because when I fought Roxy, that was the, my third pro fight. And she was, uh, she had already had like 20 something pro fight, I think. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I was, I was a young, I was a young up and comer and, you know, we took that fight on short notice. We thought it was a great fight and it was, and I lost a split decision. It was close. Um, and I learned a lot in that fight and I, I learned a lot about where I was at at that point in my career. And I feel like I've gotten so much better because I learned so much from that loss alone and, um, you know, every loss since then. Um, but I'm excited about going out there, you know, and proving, proving to everybody, you know, that, you know, I feel like maybe I should, you know, I, I could have won that fight, you know, that just, that fight that night, just, it wasn't my night. Yeah. And that was your third professional fight. Um, so obviously, you know, a lot has happened since you've, you've gained a lot, a lot of experience. Um, how much different are you? Where would you say you're, you're the most different, uh, compared to, um, you know, Andrea Lee, you know, two and no heading into that bout? Well, I've, I've definitely worked a lot on my wrestling and my jujitsu has gotten so much better since then, because we, we took like, you know, some time to just focus on just straight jujitsu. I mean, I, I hit up like all the, the tournament, like, you know, like I ran on like a, a I went on like a jujitsu streak where all we did was just like compete at tournaments, you know, just to kind of like push myself and make myself get better. And, um, you know, we, we focused on a lot there for a couple of years and you know I'm still focusing on that I'm still continuing to get better um as all fighters are um but I think that that's probably where you'll see that I've gotten a lot better at you know my wrestling my jiu-jitsu my takedown defense yeah and uh last question um entering that bout obviously you were very young in in, in your MMA career and, and Roxanne had a bunch of fights as you mentioned she already had like over 20 fights um, are you kind of surprised that you're meeting her again in 2020? Because that was six years ago, and you know she's still kicking ass and and still among the best in in the division. And I'm really not, you know. Um, Roxanne, like she, she, I mean, she does surprise me, but she's inspiring, you know. I mean, the fact that she's still she's in, you know like in the UFC, still been in the top ten, you know, like she came back. You know, she got cut from the UFC, went back to Invicta, went on a, a, a win streak, and then got called back into the UFC. And she's been in the UFC ever since. I mean, like that's super impressive and inspiring to me. It doesn't, it, it doesn't um, surprise me that her and I are matching back up. I knew it was going to happen eventually. I've had people that have always asked me at the end of every fight, "You need to call out Roxanne." I'm like, "No, I'm not gonna," because I don't like to call out people. But they've, been, I've had people been wanting this match to happen, and I was like, "It's gonna happen on its own time." You know, so just let it happen. And, and it, it worked out perfectly. You know, I mean, we both lost to Lauren. You know, she was our last opponent. And and I had a feeling that they were going to match me and Roxy up. You know, and then whenever I got the call and the name was Roxy, I was like, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. You know, I was like, but I'm ready. You know, I think it's time. You know, we're, we're both in the top 10. I think it's time that we, we rematch, you know, and it's in the UFC. And, you know, can't, we're getting paid a lot more. <laughs> Couldn't get better than that. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Best of luck this weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andrew. That is all the time we had for you. Awesome. Great work. Next up, we will be joined by one half of our main event and the number eight ranked UFC women's strawweight, Michelle Watterson. We now welcome the number eight ranked UFC women's strawweight in the world, Michelle Watterson. Michelle, thank you for the time. Of course, guys. Thanks for having me. We will take the first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Hi, Michelle. 
How's it going? It's going well. Thank you for asking. Um, people are saying that there's beef going on with you and Angela. Is this true or did I miss something? I think um, I think you might have missed something. I don't know. <laughs> if there is, I don't know about it. <laughs> I'm just excited to get in there and and um, and throw some leather. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, it's like, I know you guys did the video together. I think a lot of people love the Don't Rush Challenge with yourself and all the other women of MMA. Can you talk about how that one came together in the pandemic? Here's the thing, guys. Like, um, we're in the hurt business. You know, the objective of the fight is to inflict the most damage. There's nothing, there's no way around that. Um, and so I guess in that sense, both of us want to win. But at the end of the day, we are more alike than we are different. We have more similarities then we have differences and so we can bond and and try to to share some positivity in the world in that sense as well and and i think that it, it just goes to to show you our sportsmanship and our respect for one another in in this sport you're coming off a close one against carla Sparza. what did you take from that fight to help you grow as a fighter when you went back to the gym um to to not be so hung up on strategy i think that you know it, it's kind of hard to, to say you know it's always going to be those shoulda woulda couldas and what i understand is that you know everything happens for a reason and i had to come back to the gym and understand to not leave it in the hands of the judges um it was um my fight to be won and it slipped through my fingers and, and that's my fault so um you know it, it was a very close fight and, and it didn't have to be so that's what i learned is is to to take control of the situation and if i have the opportunity to finish the fight then to finish the fight so michelle we know you're very popular and being even owing to i think a lot of people say you know karate hottie isn't about to be cut from the ufc but you know is there pressure you know you don't want to get that third loss in a row obviously is that in your mind or how do you separate that when you're in camp um, it's not in my mind. My, my mind, it, it, all, all camp is just to improve and to get better and to, to unleash what I have inside of me. I've been fighting for over 13 years. I've been doing martial arts for, 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 um, for over 25 years. I mean, it's, it's insane that uh, I, I, I don't go in and step into the octagon and uh, unleash all of my tools. And so that's just what I've, um, really embraced this fight camp is to to love what i do to go out there and 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 um utilize all the tools that i have and, and to not um restrict myself from any of it because it is mma i'm not just a stand-up fighter i have nine submissions under my under my win i have an amazing world-renowned wrestling coach i have an amazing um husband who who was an amazing boxer in his own right who's been sharpening my tools as a boxer so i have all these tools i'm just gonna let it all out final question what is uh, what does angela hill bring as an opponent i think angela hill is hungry i think that she has a lot of grit i think she's riding on this momentous um string of of, of fights that she's had She's a volume striker, and um, and she's game. Those are the things that she presents, and those are the things that I'm ready for. Thank you, Michelle. Good luck. Thank you. We will take the next set of questions from Ezekiel Berganzi with Super Luchas. Hello, Michelle. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thank you. So, how do you feel now that on short notice you became the main event of this evening? It's really exciting. Um, you know, I'm, I am grateful that the UFC um, put trust in Angela and I to uh, put on a show um, strong enough to, to uphold the, the main event. And I know that we will deliver. The straw weights always deliver. And what adjustments did you made in, did you make on your game plan uh, after your last fight? I think it's just to let it fly, honestly. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a couple of fights for things to come out that you've been working on. And um, every fight I learn and I grow and I evolve as a fighter and, and I allow my weaknesses to become my strengths. So um, when, you, when you're fighting in the sport of MMA, there's so many things to focus on. And so I'm just, I just focus on being the best mixed martial artist that I can be. 
and uh, you and Angela both come with losses, so I, I really expect that you know uh, going to are going to fight really um, with this hunger of winning. No, so what kind of fight do you expect uh, uh, taking account of this fact? I think you, you hit it on the nail when you said that we're both really hungry to get back in there and um, get in the win column, especially after those controversial fights. Um, and, and that's what it is. I'm hungry and I'm looking to fill my belly with that W. And so I know she is too, but uh, I'm starving. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much and good luck on Saturday. Thank you. And we will take our next questions from Danny Segura with MMA Junkie. Show. Um, just last weekend, we saw Alistair Overeem, a veteran of the sport, uh, say basically like he was understanding that he was on, on his last title run. Um, you're 34 years old. I know you're still in shape and still competing with the best. Uh, but but I'm wondering, um, do you kind of feel like that? Do you feel like uh, the clock is ticking for you here and, and you got to turn things around? Um, or do you see yourself still having a, a sort of long career? Uh, you know, I found myself falling into the trap of trying to, to look ahead and, and trying to map out um, my journey. And all that does is distract me from being in the moment. And so right now I'm in the moment. My focus and mission is to beat Angela this Saturday. And that's what I'm focusing on. And, um, you know, martial arts will always be a part of my life regardless. But um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not looking past Angela. My focus is this Saturday. And uh, speaking of Angela, um, her last bout was pretty controversial. I'm wondering if, if you get got to see her last fight and what you think of it. Did you think that uh, she she got wrong there in the decision? Do you think she she should have won that fight? You know, I think it depends on the type of uh, style you like to watch. You like to fight, like to watch a striker, or do you like to watch you know a grappler who is um, constantly putting forward pressure and you know um, controlling the cage? It, it really depends. That fight could have gone either way. The same as me and Carla's fight could have gone either way. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why they matched the two of us up. <laughs> so I'm guessing you, you thought she wants is uh, you're a striker and, and you like watching striking or, or no? I, I, I know I'm the karate hottie, but I wouldn't consider myself a striker. I would consider myself a, a mixed martial artist. Mm. Um, and I have a lot of wins by submission. So um, like I said, that fight could have gone either way. I, I did watch it back. And, um, and turned off the, the, the um, commentating. And, I, you know, I thought that um, Claudia did enough to win. And uh, um, Angela recently uh, entered the, the rankings, but a lot of people, even Claudia Gadella after the fight, said she was very underrated and, and she's actually been uh, among the top uh, with, you know, for, for quite some time. Um, do, you, do you feel that way towards Angela? Do you feel like maybe she's, she's a bit underrated in, in her career? I think that Angela has done an amazing job at climbing up the ladder and taking fights and, and doing what she has to do to, to get noticed. Um, she's a scrappy fighter and, and a volume fighter, and her skills have only been improving since she's come back to the UFC after becoming champion at Victa. Um, I, never, I never underestimate any of my opponents that I step inside the cage with. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Good luck this weekend. We will take our next questions from Van Tate with KRQE News. What's going on, Michelle? Hey, Van. Good to good to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey. So, so since you guys got bumped up to uh, main event, and I know you're excited about being the main event. Have you have you had to guard against like being too pumped up? You know, like just let it be the main event. Just just treat it as a regular fight. You know, I think that's kind of my my mo anytime i i come to to fight for fight week is regardless of its main event first fight of the night a fight in the back alley or amongst a million a million fans um when you step into the octagon it's just you and your opponent across the cage and that's that's always been um my go-to when it comes to how do how do i approach the fight and then you know each each training camp has its own feel how did you feel with this camp and, and as you head into this fight? It was an amazing camp. I felt the fire in my heart grow um, each week, and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to just unleash, go out there and have some fun. And what do you think you have to do to be successful in this fight? 
I just have to be myself. Go out there, bite down on my mouthpiece, and, and let it go. Are you, do you feel like uh, since you guys have that in common as far as being former Invicta champions, that, that's just another carrot on the on the table to, to, to fight for, right? Absolutely. You know, we're <laughs> I fight because I want to win, and, and I want to beat the very best out there. So for sure, it would be great on my resume. Do you feel like you need this one as far as to uh, – to keep your name in the conversation for the UFC strawweight title, you know, as a contender and, and to get that shot. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and could you elaborate on that? Why, why you feel like that? Both, you know, both Angela and I are, are chomping at the bits to get to the top. And there's kind of a, like a, a stale, like it's kind of stagnant at the top because of, because of the, the nature of what, what has happened, you know, in the world today, um, you know, Nina is, is out, um, because she's you know, getting ready to have a baby and, and uh, Suarez is injured. Um, Rose just broke her nose. And so, you know, there's, there's some wiggle room, room for who gets the, who gets the next uh, uh, shot at the title. And, and, and I, I want it to be me. And I know there's not going to be a, a crowd there and stuff like that, but do you, do you guys still work on your entrance? How you want to come in? <laughs> Even without a crowd there, do you, do you still want to look fly when you're coming in? Oh, I'm, I'm looking fly no matter what, even when I'm waking <laughs> up. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have, we prepared for, for what it feels like to walk out without a crowd. And, and, and so it's like, what, I pull energy from the crowd, but now what do I pull energy from? I pull energy from the sound of my glove hitting her face. I pull energy from the sound of my shin hitting her thigh. I pull energy from the sound of her body hitting the mat. Those are, that's where I'll pull the energy from. Hey, sounds like she's, she's going to get roughed up a little bit. So, <laughs> hey, thanks, thanks so much, Michelle. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Damon Martin with MMA Fighting. Hey, Michelle. Uh, I apologize if this was asked already, but uh, I saw obviously when this guy, fight got bumped up to main event, you guys are doing five rounds. Now, we've seen a couple other short notice main events come together, uh, the Anthony Smith fight, and, and they ended up being three rounds. Uh, can you kind of give me an idea? Like, did they ask you to do five rounds? Did you want to do five rounds? It's a main event. You got to do five rounds. And, and my per <laughs> I'm never one to shy down from a, from a challenge. And this was an amazing challenge to take. And, and I was up for, for it. Were you given that option or did you immediately volunteer and say, I want to do five rounds? I just figured that it, that's kind of, you know, the responsibility you take on as a, as a main event fighter. You've you've been in main events, obviously a couple of big ones in the UFC. You've been here before, uh, being under that spotlight. Do you do you embrace that, and do you believe that actually is you know? Because uh, some people, you know, they kind of fade under the spotlight. Some people shine under the spotlight. You've been a person who's kind of always embraced that. Do you do you kind of embrace this moment of kind of taking advantage of being the main event now? I think you have to embrace all these special moments because if you don't, they come and go. And then when you look back at it, you're like, man, I didn't appreciate that moment for what it was. This is such an amazing moment in my life. Why would I, why would I shy away from it? Why, why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I, you know, open up the curtains and, and breathe in that, that fresh air? Um, I, this is historic. I just, I, sometimes because I've been fighting for so long, I forget how cool it is to be doing what I get to do. And um, I, I, I do have to kind of sit down and, and, and smell the roses sometimes. If you, and if, if you don't, like, what's all the hard work, blood, sweat, and tears for? What is it for if you don't appreciate these moments? Absolutely. Uh, with that being said, Said, Michelle, we talked uh, earlier about, you know, uh, Angela having a bit of a, a controversial decision in her last fight. You were also, uh, you know, in a fight that was very, very close. You know, obviously, this is a, a sport at the highest levels. You're not going to go out and knock out every single opponent you face. But is there a point in a fight like this to go out and kind of put an exclamation point and leave no doubt, especially coming off a, a very hard fought split decision? Yeah. There is. You, you you don't want any doubt within your mind, with the judge's mind, and, and with the world. Um, that is always, uh, that should always be the objective. Um, since I've been fighting for the UFC outside of my UFC debut, I fought 
top 10 girls, you know, always. And so when, when you get up to the, to the top tier of, of, of competition, you know, getting those finishes becomes so much harder. And I, and I hope that people understand that it's because the, the competition is so thick and rich with talent and technique. Um, getting a finish isn't something that you can um, force or uh, it is, is, is something that, um, that happens through in the moment. And um, uh, so that's what I plan on do, doing is, is being in the moment. I'm not gonna try to force anything, but for sure the motivation is to finish the fight. And, and last question, Michelle, when you look at Angela, her style, I don't wanna pigeonhole her and say she's only a striker, but I think everyone knows she likes to strike. Uh, do you feel like you've seen those holes, those openings in her game where you can take advantage of that and make this a more one-sided fight? Or, you know, if the opportunity presents itself to get that finish, because you've had those dominant finishes, obviously, throughout your career. Yes, like I said, the objective is to finish the fight, and I do think that she has holes in her game that I will capitalize on. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And we will take our last set of questions from Cassandra Cousineau with Las Vegas Sports Biz. Hi there, Michelle. How are you? Good. Good to see your face today. Um, question, first question for me is you were part of some of the early cards in Jacksonville in the smaller cage. Did you learn anything in that fight that actually you deemed to be helpful going into Apex? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just kind of being comfortable with the idea that there isn't a crowd being comfortable with the idea that I could hear my corner and, and she could hear my corner. Um, understanding that I had to draw um, energy from different places other than the, um, the crowd. All those small little things, you know, play a factor and definitely uh, we were able to, to kind of fine tune how we trained in order to prepare ourselves for that. Second question is, in addition to some adjustments you've had to make in your career due to the pandemic, you're also a mom of a young daughter. I know a lot of schools are doing things a little differently. Um, can you talk me through some of the challenges that you face having a daughter while you're also trying to figure out um, this kind of new era in your career? Um, you know, there's so many things that happen in my fight career that I learned that I can then transfer over into um, life lessons for myself and for, for my family and for my daughter. Um, something that really stuck out to me is how courageous and brave the UFC was in stepping outside of the comfort zone of the pandemic and, and moving forward and pressing forward and figuring out a way to, to give us all work and allow us all to continue to pursue our passions during this pandemic. It, um, it, it really inspired me to, to instill that within my daughter. Okay, this has happened. This is out of our control. So now what can we do to grow from this versus allow it to make us submit to it? Um, there are always going to be problems in this world and you have to figure out as an individual, how are you going to deal with this problem and how are you going to overcome this problem? And so, you know, with the pandemic and my daughter, you know, getting over the hump of homeschooling and having her understand to be more uh, self-sufficient and having her be more outspoken when she's having trouble um, to her teacher over Zoom and to her parents, um, having her understand how to still socialize and connect with people over Zoom and, or, and while she's wearing a face mask and, and, and keeping her healthy and keeping her active. These are all things and keeping her under um, and teaching her the importance of nutrition and the importance of, of, of hygiene. These are all things that are going to help her in her future, regardless of what else is there to come. And finally, for me, um, about, I guess, going back to 2011, Dana was adamant that there weren't going to be women fighting in the UFC. And here you are on short notice headlining uh, a card. How does that feel for you? And do you think about those days when you thought maybe the door was closed? And, and do you embrace now how many opportunities you have in this promotion? It is the coolest thing in the world. I remember being in my apartment, moving out to 
Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, still being a local fighter and having a vision board in my apartment. And at that time, Dana didn't think that he'd ever see girls in there. And I still had it on my vision board that I was going to be fighting for the UFC. And here I am, fighting for the main event, and it's amazing. Thank you, Michelle. Good luck Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That is all the time we had for you. Thanks, guys. And next up, we will be joined by UFC light heavyweight Mike Rodriguez. I like interacting with people. I love people. So, you know, it's always fun to interact with. And usually I get a lot of positive feedback and love and support. So, yeah. why not return it, you know? And not, not afraid to laugh at yourself, too. Like, posting, like, me, me. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. <laughs> we now welcome UFC light heavyweight Mike Rodriguez. Mike, thank you for the time, sir. Yeah, no problem. We will take the first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cape Side Press. Sick question. Next question. <laughs> Let me stop. Sorry, one second, Mike. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Nobody stays in these rooms, right? No, no, this, yeah. this room is just empty for it would suck if someone's like, dude, I'm trying to get a fucking nap in. Like, could you guys like hurry it up? Uh, yeah, I don't know. We've had this room for like two months. Yeah, yeah. I kind of like the bubble, honestly. I kind of like it. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's unmuted. It's unmuted. I didn't know if you had your. No, the they, camera ready. they can't. Okay, so they're struggling to something. I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. So you can look here and I'll talk. All right. All right, man. So first of all, you're back again. It's just been a few weeks. What was the biggest uh, factor in you deciding to come back so quickly? Um, the opportunity was there. Uh, you know, what they say when the opportunity knocks, open the door. So open the door, the opportunity come in and have a seat. So that's why I'm here. And your opportunity is a, against a veteran of the sport, a guy that you, you've watched plenty of times, I'm sure. And so yeah. when you're fighting a guy that you, you do know so well and you've seen kind of over the years, does that add a little bit more, uh, you know, fuels with fire? Is it a little more fun to fight a guy that you recognize and you know about? Uh, a mixture of all of it. A mixture of all of it. Uh, oh, excuse me. It's cool to fight against somebody with so much experience because, uh, you know, it kind of it, it helps me test my skills. Um, I've been in this, I've been fighting for what, 10 years, something like that. Jeez. So, uh, time flies. So yeah. So just the fact that I, you know, I develop my skills over the time and I get to test it against somebody who will, you know, who's been through it all. You know what I mean? It's fun. It's great. You had the first experience of, you know, coming to the apex and fighting with no crowd and stuff just, just two or three weeks ago. Yeah. And now you're going to do it again. What do you think of fighting with no crowd and kind of in this uh, pandemic era of MMA, if you will? Um, I didn't mind it because it, I'm, I'm a contender series guy. So we didn't have a crowd anyways. So um, it's, it was the same. Just go out there and just fight. I, I, I can't really focus on the crowd anyways when I'm, somebody's 
full five trunk punch me in the face. So, yeah. You talked a little bit uh, about, you know, in 2019, you had a lot of distractions going on and, uh, you know, with, with working as a bartender and all these things and being able to, you know, just get enough sleep to train properly was difficult last year. Now this year, you, you said you got a refresh focus. Mm -hmm. You come in, you, it's a kind of a springboard for you this year. Uh, what has been the biggest change in the, in the pandemic that has allowed you to kind of focus on you and get to where you want to be? Um, I would say the biggest change, I would say just being able to solely focus on fighting, nothing else. I don't have to worry about like, oh, what's my schedule for next weekend? Uh, do I need, what do I need for the bar? <laughs> to what cups I need? Like I don't have to focus on any of the other external stresses, you know? I could just train and I think this is like the best moment everybody because all you all we can do is what we love to do which is train and fight that's it you can't do nothing else you can't go to clubs you can't you know what i mean you can't really go out to the restaurants none of that so just train and fight so why not abuse that as much as possible and i wanted to ask how satisfying was that that win that you got just three weeks ago coming off of the difficult end that you had in 2019 and then to get that that big victory pretty quickly as well and come out healthy how satisfying was it for you Oh man, it was, it was really satisfying. It's, it's rejuvenating, you know, because what last year I went 0 and 2, you know, so it sucked. Well, you don't get one and one because one was a no contest, but even still, even that no contest, I lost, you know, and so being able to spring back board, spring back for a win to get me back in that winning column was just amazing. You know, it, it's something what I needed, what my fan base needed. My friends, my family, like everybody who supports me, well, you know, this is something that we needed. And uh, it gave us hope that, we, you know, we're still in this fight. And we can still do it. And when you get a win like that, you, you ride an emotional high into this next one, considering it's just right around the corner. You know, sometimes you, you get a win and you wait six months, eight months, a year, whatever. You're waiting three weeks before you jump back in there. Are you still kind of riding that emotional high and that momentum into this fight? Uh, no. I To me, I'm, a, I'm a, like a reset person. So it, it's the past. You know, you accept the past, it's over and done. So I won three weeks ago. It happened. It's done. I had my fun the week after. You know what I mean? I had my camp with my family. It was great. And uh, then I had to get back to work. So just back to work, it's like from going from ground zero all over again. So we went up, then we were right back down to build back up. That's it. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. I think yeah. someone else is going to ask a question. It's just... Yeah, Mike, we're going to try this again. We're going to take Gabriel Gonzalez from Cape Side Press. All right, cool. Hey, Mike, can you hear me this time? I'm sorry, man. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I can hear you. Um, yeah, so if I missed it, I apologize. Technical issues. Uh, just really want to ask how this fight came together seemingly so quickly. So um, I so after I, I beat Pretch, you know, I was injury-free. Didn't have nothing wrong with me. It was golden. And uh, I got to the – I was at the airport, and Joe – Joe Lozon and uh, Steve Mays, my two coaches, they both texted me. I was like, stay ready because the way everything's going right now, you don't know what can happen. Opportunity will come. So I said, all right, cool. So he's they're like, you know, take your time, enjoy your time off. And then, you know, the wife and the kid, we had, we enjoyed our, uh, you know, our, our camping trip because we planned a camping trip the following week. And then right after that, I was done with the camping trip. I went right back to the gym. Um, did a little, like, did a little bit of work with some teammates. And then as soon as I was done training, got a phone call from Tyson, my manager. And he was like, hey, remember when I told you to stay ready? I'm like, yeah. He's like, we got something. You're fighting Ed Harmon. And he's like, oh, you know, Tyson, you want, you want to take the fight? I'm like, yeah, take that fight. Let's run it. And he was like, all right, yeah, cool. So that's how we ended up getting it. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad for Ed because, like, he went through, like, what, like five or six opponent changes, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it's, it's good. It's all good. I mean, we'll certainly be asking him about that. Can I ask, you, you just fought recently. You're right back at the Apex. I'm assuming they have you at the same hotel in Vegas. I mean, does it feel like deja vu? I mean, when you're in the UFC, it's very rare that you're going straight back to the same exact place immediately. <laughs> I know, right? Um, it, it, just, it just feels comfortable. Because I was already here, you know. I, uh, I'm a person I get comfortable quick. I was already here, so I already know how 
everything that happened and how everything works and everything. So I just adapted and just soak up, soak it all up. Do you do things like ask for the same hotel room or anything like that? No, 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 no. <laughs> nah, I just, uh, I just took whatever they gave me. Gotcha. Um, you talk about Ed Herman. Obviously, this guy's got a lot more UFC fights than a, a lot of people. I mean, just talk about him and your assessment of him as an opponent. Uh, Ed Herman's he's good. He's tough. He's so tanky. I, I didn't realize how tanky he was until I went back and watched the fights. He's very tanky. So um, that's something that you got to take in to you gotta take into you know consideration because i can't think of oh yeah i'm just gonna go blow him out of the water in the first round eh, guys like that doesn't happen so you know i, I gotta be smart more persistent discipline and persistence is i think what is not what i think is what beats him is is that so uh as long as i'm di stay disciplined and stay persistent i I'll, i will get the win for sure um but yeah he's good and he's really good at bringing people into brawls and he, you know, he's a brawler himself. So he's really good at that. So it's, it's going to be awesome. Hey, thanks Mike. Good luck. No problem. Thank you. And we will take our next set of questions from Danny Segura with MMA junkie. Hey Mike, um, just quickly, you, you said, uh, he was tanky. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Durable, durable. He's very durable. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah, no, I figured it'd be something along those, those lines. <laughs> and uh, and obviously, this is uh, somewhat of a short notice fight for you. Um, in these type of fights, like, is there much time to strategize, or do you kind of just go in there and fight? Um, well, we we didn't really have much time to game plan with him, um, so we just kind of just went in there and fight. The only thing we really like touch up on is like. Uh, a lot of his clinch work. He has good clinch work. He, he's really good on the clinch. Uh, granted, I know y'all like, well, you just wanted the clinch, but yeah, his, his clinch is good too. So that's something to take and consider it. He, he just has a different style of clinching. Muay Thai is my dominant background. So I have more Muay Thai clinching. He is his wrestling. So he has more that Greco uh, team quest type of clinch, but um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a clash of styles. It's going to be cool. Yeah. And, and as a guy that's, you know, I know you've been in the UFC now for a couple of years, but you know, as a guy that's been fairly new, let's just say, um, is, is it nice to get these type of opponents? And is are these the kind of names that you're looking for, like these veterans that you know have been around for quite some time and and are quite uh, well known by by fans? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I I, um, I, I like this fight a lot. I really do. Um, matter of fact, not like I love this fight a lot. Um, it's cool to fight someone from a whole another generation. You know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like more the newer breed, more the newer generation, and he's more the uh, the older generation. What I what inspired me to get here, he's one of the guys, you know. So it, it's cool to test your skills against the guys you was watching. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And uh, what about the weight cut? Obviously, another weight cut uh, within a sort of short uh, amount of span uh, time span. Um, how how do you feel weight cut wise? And uh, is that ever an issue? Like taking fights? Like oh wait, let me let me check up on my weight first. No, so <laughs> I didn't balloon up, so that was good. Uh, they got me at a good time. I was like, I was like walking around. I would say like two twenty three ish, two twenty five. So that's good. It, like I was like, yeah. So that that was more incentive to take the fight because my weight was already low. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, for sure. And I know you're a Twitch uh, streamer. What are you playing these days? Uh, recently, I haven't been able to set up consistent stream schedule due to this, all the training I've been doing. But um, when I get back, I'll stop focusing on that. And the game is always Siege. I play a lot of Siege. That's like okay. my lifestyle game. But right now, what I've been playing in the room on Fight Week is uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Man, that game is so fun. <laughs> it's dope. Highly recommend it. It's really good. I'm definitely going to check that out. Right. Thanks, Mike. Best of luck yeah. this week. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. That is all the time we had for you, sir. Thank you, guys. You guys have a good one. And next up, we will be joined by UFC lightweight Otman Azaitar.
Okay, and they have time to answer? Or? Yeah, they don't yeah. have time. It's just the regular interview. Yep. Okay. It's like a phone interview, but just through there, and you're just looking through the whole time. Okay. We now welcome UFC lightweight Otman Azaitar. Otman, thank you for the time today, sir. Thank you. We will take the first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Okay, Hello. welcome. Hi, Otman. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Loud. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Loud and clear. Loud <laughs> <laughs> So this fight was rescheduled from several months ago. How did you take the extra time to prepare for this specific opponent? Yeah, it was supposed to be normally in April 18, but because of the global pandemic, it was uh, canceled. So uh, yeah, I used the time to stay in training, uh, to stay uh, safe and healthy. And I wish uh, the whole world uh, too. Uh, yes, I used the whole time training and was waiting till I get the opportunity to, to fight again. And now we got it. Was there ever any talk about fighting somebody else? Uh, no. The time when I get the opportunity to fight again, it was the same opponent like last time. Gotcha. Um, you've had experience fighting in Abu Dhabi before. Was there ever any talk about having you on Fight Island? And would you have wanted to go back to fight in Abu Dhabi? Uh, the offer which I got was to fight in Vegas, not in uh, Abu Dhabi Fight Island. But I heard a lot about uh, Fight Island Abu Dhabi. And uh, yeah, I, I, had, I heard about the nice hospitality of uh, the country and uh, that everything is very good there and everything said perfectly. And yes, for me, uh, I fight anywhere, uh, everywhere, every time. Uh, but my brother gonna fight next, uh, I think October 10, he gonna fight in Abu Dhabi and I will be cornering him and I will make also then the experience over there and see how it is in life. Understood, understood. Um, you've had a great career already, but making it to the UFC, what is it like now to be in the world's biggest promotion? And I'm assuming you get even more attention than you did before. Alhamdulillah, I, uh, I uh, like every other UFC fighter uh, who worked hard in his career before he get in the UFC, it's like the it's the biggest organization it's like the champions league of the mma and it's a big dream it's the biggest dream of uh, every fighter to get in the ufc and i appreciate ufc uh, to 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 have me to to to, to had offered me the the contract and i'm happy to be on this organization uh, yes it's like a dream came true and now i'm living the dream congratulations um, can I ask a final question? What is your assessment of Kama Worthy as an opponent? Assessment? What's the assessment? Uh, just what do you think of him as an opponent? What makes him dangerous? For me, it doesn't matter. Uh, I take every opponent serious. And for me, every uh, opponent is a threat. And every opponent is uh, dangerous. It's MMA. It's not dancing or something like this, you know. We have small gloves for ounces. Every fight can, every punch can decide the fight. So you have to take every uh, opponent uh, serious. So I don't make a difference between him or other opponents. And uh, yes, this is the work of my coaches to to watch him and uh, to prepare me in the way I have to fight him. Thank you and good luck. Welcome. Thank you very much. We will take our next questions from Gavin Porter with UFC.com. All right, so you're fighting a guy in Kama Worthy who's coming off of a couple big UFC victories. When you're fighting a guy with momentum like that and you're undefeated, is, do you think this is an important matchup for, for this, this division and for your career? Yeah, for me, every, every fight is important. Every opponent uh, is important. 
and now I appreciate you see that they put me on the co-main event I appreciate I appreciate them a lot for this trust and uh, it's a motivation for me to give uh, my best to put my whole effort yes to uh, show myself to show myself from my best side and to put uh, the best performance I can do it's been almost a year since we've seen you fight in the UFC. What, what in the time in this year have you added to your game that you're excited to show off on Saturday? <laughs> yeah, I've been training the whole year. Uh, uh, I, I improved my skills in wrestling, in jiu-jitsu, and yes, let's see. The last time we saw you was a spectacular knockout. Do you believe that that's the type of things that fans and, and we can come to expect from when we get to see one of your fights? Uh, I think the fans like and love uh, fights in uh, stand up to, or stand up. They want to see blood. They want to see knockouts, punches. Uh, this is what the fans uh, like, and we we have to be also uh, grateful and thankful to the fans and try to give them back what they want to see and what but what we expect i don't know we i never give uh, predictions i can just say that i gave already my best in the training and this i gonna do also in the fight inshallah is that your style is that you know, what we can we can expect from you is those type of you know exciting <laughs> stand-up fights I hope so. I don't like to give props to myself, but if the fans see it like this, I appreciate it and I hope uh, that they like my style and uh, find that uh, my style is exciting and uh, I have done everything right. And my last question is, if you get this win, especially and you make a statement over someone who has a couple UFC wins in a row over some notable guys like Common Worthy does, where do you think it puts you going forward in your career? Every fight brings you forward, and uh, every fight is a step, and uh, you have to focus for every step, and when you finish this step, then you think about the bigger steps. So, <laughs> the next uh, steps, inshallah, will be uh, bigger steps, and this is like uh, a topic which I have to discuss with uh, the management and with the coaches, but alhamdulillah, we are ready for everything. Great, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Adnan. That is all the time we had for you. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, everybody outside there, for your support. I really appreciate it. And I hope, inshallah, we give you the best performance we can do. Next up, we will be joined by UFC light heavyweight Ed Herman. We now welcome UFC light heavyweight Ed Herman. Ed, thank you for the time today, sir. Yeah, no problem. We will take the first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Hey, Ed. First of all, there have been so many twists and turns with opponents. How would you describe the relief to finally be at fight week? Well, I was at fight week last time, too, and I found out the day of, you know, my fight was canceled. So I'm not counting anything until I step in that cage. I mean, when you've had that happen, I mean, look, I, I'd be stressed if I were you because everything's been, you know, so temperamental with getting to fight night. I mean, how do you push a lot of that stress out of the way so you can be in the right mind frame to compete at your best? Well, not giving a fuck. <laughs> I'm like, hey, it is what it is. New opponent, this, that. I've been doing this for 20 years, man, so... All kinds of shits happen over the years, so I'm just like, 
you know, where I'm at in my career. Each fight could be my last. You never know with injuries and things going down with, with all this COVID stuff and, you know, fires burning and tornadoes and hurricanes. Who the hell knows what's going to happen? All I know is Saturday night, I'm going to go in there and get, get the job done. And, you know, that's all I can do. I mean, you've been in the UFC so long. You've been through, you know, I believe Spike and then Box and now ESPN. And now we're in the pandemic era. I mean, how would you describe it for you? I mean, you've fought in so many different eras of the UFC. Uh, it's kind of weird to think about sometimes because, you know, time flies and you just live in life. And, you know, it doesn't really sink in until I sit back and think about it, how long I've been doing this. So, you know, I'm just trying to enjoy the moment. Uh, there's a lot of years where I let the nerves get to me and just the uncomfortableness of doing what we do. And, and really, like I said, just, just not, not taking it, uh, too serious. I mean, take it serious, but just like, like it is what it is. Let's, let's, let's do what we got to do. And, and I'm going to train and try to stay healthy and things are going to happen, you know, in life, things are going to happen. Uh, bad things happen, you know, to good people, bad luck, whatever. So I'm just, I'm just riding the wave, man. And just trying to enjoy enjoy my time while I'm here so I can look back someday and, and say that I enjoyed it, you know, and, and have good memories. Does it feel like a throwback to the Ultimate Fighter? Small cage, no fans, not too many people, anything like that? Yeah, I guess a little bit. I'll tell you after I fight on Saturday because I haven't had the opportunity to, to fight in the Apex yet with no fans. So it's going to be a little weird, but we'll see, you know. Uh, yeah, it's crazy, man. It's a weird times. Most guys hope to have a career as long as yours in the UFC. I mean, can you pinpoint it to any particular thing or any particular secret as to why you've been able to be one of those guys in there for so long? Well, because I'm one of the real BMS, for one. And for two, uh, yeah, man, this is just what I do, you know. Uh, when I was younger, I didn't, I didn't, you know, uh, maybe take care of myself as good as I should have, you know. So these days, you know, being a little older and more mature, I just, I take care of my body better. You know, I eat better. I, I work on my recovery more. I don't party like I did when I was a kid. You know, just all those little things add up. Uh, you know, um, you know, my family and my friends and my team are, are, uh, you know, of the most importance to me. And you know, you, you push the rest out. You know, so you just. You know, trust the people who are around you, who, who, who you know are going to, you know, have your back and just like I'm, I'm with the same coaches. You don't see me jumping around different coaches. I'm with, I got the same crew, you know, for years. I mean, I've moved a few times, you know, like back to Colorado and back out to Oregon. But, you know, um, I think staying, uh, staying with your with your people and letting things develop and trusting, you know, trusting your people, really. Last one for me. What is what does Mike Rodriguez bring, bring as an opponent? Um, you know, he's got some youth. He's got some height. He's a left-handed guy, so it's you know a little different than some other guys I've fought. Uh, um, I'm excited for the fight. He likes to get in the clinch and battle, and you know, so do I. So I think we're going to have some fun and uh, and give the the crowd and and everybody uh, an awesome fight. You know, so uh, I'm really excited to get in there. Uh, Mike seems like a nice guy. Which is cool. I'm not like a an angry type of fighter guy, so it's it's cool to like be a sportsman and, and go in there and and not really have animosity towards a guy. Sometimes I compete better like that, so uh, it's, it's kind of it's kind of uh, you know it's good. I'm excited for the fight. Thank you, Ed. Good luck. So. And we will take our next questions from Danny Segura with MMA Junkie. Sorry, one second. Can you hear me? Yo. Hello? I can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was uh, saying, like, you know, you've been around the sport for quite some time. Uh, this whole thing's crazy with the pandemic. Plus, like, I think you've had a very uh, unique case with all the um, bouts that have fallen through. Would you say this is, like, the craziest thing you, you've witnessed um, in the last few weeks? Like, the, la the craziest period of your fight career? Yes, kind of. It kind of reminds me of like the beginning of my career when you know you wouldn't even know who your opponent was. You know, you'd always have like changes. There was no like 
the internet wasn't like it is now with all the social media. You know, I think we had MySpace back then. Uh, so it's yeah. like, it reminds me of that a little bit and just kind of, you know, with the, with the changes and just like, whatever it is, what it is, whoever they're going to put in front of me, I'm going to be ready for. Yeah. Has, has all these bouts falling through, has it made you more eager to get in there? Like, do you feel like, I don't know, do you feel any differently uh, heading into this fight? Cause all the missed uh, opportunities. Uh, you know, not really. Like at first when the Mershart fight originally fell through back in July, it was pretty frustrating, but, uh, you know, I kind of got my head right and just got back to training. And then I think I went through five opponents for this, for this yeah. fight. Uh, so, you know, after the first or second one, I was kind of just like, whatever, what are you going to do? So like, I'm fighting somebody, hopefully, hopefully they'll get me somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to be ready. So. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned earlier how, you know, with every, all the craziness that's going on in the world, like any fight could be your, your last fight. Um, but, but if you could give us sort of a, of a timeline, do you feel like you're sort of wrapping up here in, in, in your career? How many fights do you have left, uh, in your fight career? I don't know, man. Uh, like I said, one at a time right now is the way I'm looking at it. Uh, you know, after, after this fight, I'll get back home. I'll assess the situation with my team and my family and my health is, a, you know, the most important, you know? Um, so as long as I can compete at this level and stay healthy, I'm going to keep doing it, man. I'm finally making some good money, so I'm going to try to keep stacking chips until until it, it's the end, you know? For sure. And uh, is it like a thing where you, you know, you're just willing to fight anybody or do you kind of have like a, a bucket list and, and certain things you want to accomplish or certain uh, fighters you'd like to uh, fight? You know, it don't matter to me. I'll, I'll, I'll fight anybody, really. Um, you know, I used to care about the rankings and try to work my way up the rankings and all this stuff, but Today, with all this craziness, I, I feel like none of that even matters, man. It's like, who's who's healthy and who's ready to fight? So, um, obviously, I'd like to work my way up the rankings and get another title shot. You know, if those are in the cards and I can keep making a run here, freaking awesome, man. So, you know, it, like, it, it is what it is, man. I'm trying to, you know, just try to one fight at a time, which for me, it helps me mentally. I don't put as much stress on myself that way. Um, so, just enjoying the moment and, you know, here to kick some ass until I can't do it anymore. For sure. All right, man. I appreciate the time. Best of luck this weekend. Right on. And we will take our next set of questions from Stephen Morocco with MMA Fighting. Hey, Ed, um, how has ATT Portland been affected by the fires? By the fires? Um, I heard the power was out and um, for a couple days or a day, maybe, because we had some wind storms going on and stuff, too. Um, but I don't think the fires have affected the gym uh you know there's a lot going on in in our city right now so um you know it's just crazy times crazy times did you get out of town before uh before the crap really hit the fan like with the fires and the windstorm uh kind of yeah. yeah it was pretty windy the day i left you know the plane was rocking around it was kind of a little scary but um the fires didn't really start happening until like pretty much the day I left, I think. Um, mm. You know, all that other chaos going on, like in Portland and stuff, has been going on for a while. So, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you have family in Washington? Have you or your family been affected by any of these fires or displaced by them? So I live actually in Vancouver, Washington, which is just you know a suburb of Portland, Oregon. Um, so I train. I'm, I train in both states. You know, I like depending on what I'm doing, um, but. I have, I have tons of family all over. Um, nobody's been directly affected. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are under, you know, like level two evacuations. I, I have some other friends who have already evacuated. So it's definitely affecting the community and, and people that I know and um, stuff like that. But direct family members, no, not yet. My dad lives out, out in the country a little bit. So I'm a little worried about him because he's a little older and stuff. But but yeah, it's it's pretty pretty sad, man. People are losing their homes. People are losing their lives. Uh, it's it's really sad to see. How would you describe your 2020 overall? <laughs> 2020 has been pretty fucked, man. <laughs> Just <laughs> I've, had, I've had three full fight camps and I haven't fought yet. I fight Saturday, great. I, that's one fight, but I had three full fight camps with not making any money and not getting to fight. So, I mean, I'm in the best shape of my life almost, I feel like. So that's cool, but at the same time, um, 
nobody likes working a half a year and not getting paid. So uh, it's been a little rough financially in that sense. Um, and then again, with all the, you know, the rioting and just all the chaos between people, like politics, splitting families apart, like me and my brother don't even talk, you know, it's because we're on, you know, we have different ideas of, of what the hell's going on. And it's it's been pretty fucked, man, honestly. You said you, you and your brother don't talk. Which side are you on? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, take it easy, man. I hope to see you back in Portland, too. All right. Thank you so much, Ed. That is all the time we had for you, sir. Cool. Next up, we will be joined by UFC lightweight, comma, Worthy. Danny Glover from every 90s movie. So I was like, nah, well, I'm going to just go with the regular. We now welcome UFC lightweight, comma worthy. Comma, thank you for the time today, sir. Awesome. Thanks for having me. We will take the first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Caveside Press. Hey, comma, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, man. Thanks for asking. Great. Um, you had quite the performance last time. Have you seen a rise in popularity since your last fight? Um, yeah, to a certain degree. Like, you know, people um, on social media and stuff like that. Like, yeah, so my, my uh, Instagram fan went up a little bit more. I think I broke 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. That's always nice. Um, how was preparing for this fight? You guys were scheduled before, then you fought someone else. So what was it like to circle all the way back to Ottman again? Um, I actually asked for this fight. Um, right after my last fight, my manager asked me if I wanted. I said I wanted this fight simply because I um, we we prepared for it for so long for the April card because I found out about I was going to be fighting in April and January. So I prepared for it. I just wanted to just finish it. You know, I, I hate like doing stuff and not really getting a result, whether I did good or I did bad. I want to see how it happens. So I really wanted to like finish, put the finishing touches on this one. The last time we spoke with you, you said that you were looking to have those Robbie Lawler versus Roy McDonald type of fights. Does Ottman, you know, is he the kind of dance partner you need to make one of those fights happen in your opinion? Um, on paper, he, he, he seems like he is. Uh, he's has a um, what a ninety percent finish rate. He has nine knockouts, two submissions. I have nine knockouts, three submissions. I mean, so he's like we might seem like we match up pretty well. So I think he's gonna come there. From what I see, he comes to fight, and I think that's a fun fight for the fans and stuff. Win or lose, you know, I'm definitely looking to win. But win or lose, I think it's it'll just keep pushing me to the top. For yourself, what would you most like to show in this fight? Same shit I always show, man. A-class violence. Can I curse? <laughs> no. Yeah? Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, I'm with it. Hey, good luck, Kama. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next questions from Gavin Porter with UFC.com. All right, man. So it's your second fight during this pandemic era, if you will. And what did you kind of take away from the first experience of fighting in the Apex and, and everything versus your debut, which was obviously a much different circumstance? Yeah, um, I guess it's weird with no, the whole no fan thing is kind of weird. Uh, like being able to hear everything, including the punches and the breathe, being able to hear your opponent's breathing is weird. Cause you normally only get that when you're, when you're training with your partners or like you're training at a gym 
because you just so much noise is going on in fights you can't really hear. But that was the biggest thing for me is hearing their heartbeats, hearing their breathing, hearing when they're picking their breathing up and stuff like that. But I don't really try to like under like really like figure out the pattern for the fights too much because everything's different. So I'm expecting a whole different experience this time around. Like, so it's always going to be a little bit different for every fight. And after your last fight, you said, you know, hey, I'm the real deal. Like, I think I'm proving that every time I get in there. And now you're fighting a guy who's undefeated, who's coming off of an awesome knockout himself. So what what kind of statement would it make for you to be able to finish a guy with a zero next to his name that has this type of hype? I mean, I think it'll just keep building on the type of fighter I am and the, the type of opponents that I like to fight and uh, the excitement that rises with me and stuff. So, I mean, like, I, I want to be in good fights, plain and simple. I want fun fights. I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay taking the risk of losing for the re for the reward that I'll get from getting good fights. Do you ever look back at that, that debut and that good fight you had with your good friend, obviously, but it's been a full year and your life is com completely different in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's weird because really like it's not just my life the entire world is completely different like everything how we approach fights and everything it's all completely different so like it's it, it, it's I, it, the year anniversary just happened it seems like it was forever ago because so much stuff has happened like my my uh my daughter as like she was one at the time so she's like kind of grown up and like she's become a little personality so she's almost two now so she's grabbing stuff and doing her own thing like my gym i mean like we went we've gone through the, my gym being closed down to being reopened and that like my friends have gotten fights all every so much stuff has changed up and it's like coming full circle again and it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's been a long year long, long year for the world <laughs> but when you look back on it you know was there a, sp a specific moment where you're like wow this is real like yeah, I mean, like the entire, I, I like the entire that entire weekend was cerebral, to that just in itself, just because the way the way that things happen and stuff. I mean, I still think about when I got the call from my manager house and how I thought about saying no because I did not feel like cutting nineteen pounds in four days. That was not something I wanted to do. But I mean, like just that whole experience, just everything, how it happened, how it came to play, and just how everything kind of like just like swung its way and happened that way. It's it's different. Things continue to happen for you. In fact, you're in the co-main event in, in this weekend's fight card. So the come-up has been real in a year. Yeah. <laughs> so when you when you realize you're about to be the co-main event of a UFC card and a year ago, plus some change, you weren't even in the, the UFC. So when you think of that, well, what does that initially bring in reaction? Um, that's it's crazy. I mean, like again, like I, I I I've always been the type of person to think that um like trying to have too many patterns for things can be a problem. My older brother, Akeem, he taught me that, like, sometimes you have to sit back and let things, like, kind of go into play. And, like, my UFC career has never been more unpredictable, as, as you can see. I mean, like, it goes from a fight on four-day notice to having a fight and then switch up opponents and that fight getting canceled and taking the fight with Luis Pino in three and a half weeks. And now this fight, I get the fight that I had before, and then it's like, oh, it's a regular fight. No, it's a co made event. It's like, oh, shit, this is... Stuff just keeps adding on. So, for me, it's just understanding that no matter what happens, whether I was the first fight on the prelims or if I was going to be the main event, I just need 18 minutes of pure focus. And that's, it's the same, same thought process. Awesome, man. Well, thank you. We look forward to seeing Saturday. Thanks, man. Thank you so much, Common. That is all the time we had for you, sir. Awesome. Thanks. Next up, we will be joined by the other half of our main event, number 13 ranked UFC women's strawy, Angela Hill.
I have it in my teeth. <laughs> I don't see anything. You want to scoot that way a little bit. There you go, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't see anything on the ground. Okay, cool. <laughs> as long as the camera can't see it. <laughs> That's the rule. <laughs> We now welcome the number 13 ranked UFC women's strawweight in the world, Angela Hill. Angela, thank you for the time. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> we will take the first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cape Side Press. Hey, Angela, I've heard that there's beef with you and Michelle. I mean, did I miss something? Is this true? Um, there's no beef. Uh, I think I uh, posted a, a screen grab of her kind of Gargling, <laughs> Gargling sucking up to Dana and Donald Trump on uh, Instagram. So it just made me want to punch her a little more. I, I hate suck ups. I hate when uh, people people do that. So yeah, I think that's all that people are talking about if they're if they're saying there's beef. But Michelle's been cool to me. I've been cool to her uh, in person, and uh, you know it's just gonna go down the way it's always always gonna go down. Not many people have had the careers resurgence that you have had. I mean, you know, can you just talk about that a bit? Because, you know, cut from the UFC, you come back, it was up and down for a minute. What helped you out in terms of staying focused back when things weren't so good when you came back to the UFC all the time? Um, well, it, it, it was a weird one because uh, I, I lost to two really good opponents, um, Rose and Tisha, when I first got cut. Then I went on a four fight win streak and Invicta and won the title. I, and when I came back, I fought Andrade, who nobody else wanted to fight. So I've always been up against the hardest people and I've always done well against them or been competitive against them. And for whatever reason, um, when it didn't go my way, I still didn't get the respect that I, that uh, people who were paying attention thought I deserved. So just having those motivators, uh, people who don't know me, hitting me up and saying, "Hey, uh, hey, we really, uh, we really respect your skills. We we can see your potential. We know you're going to be great one day." Um, and of course, like the people who do know me, who do see me working hard in the gym, uh, see me coming back after a loss the next the next day in the gym and working on my mistakes and trying to trying to fix them and become a, a more complete fighter. Uh, those people always help motivate me and help uh, keep me just uh, keep me grounded and allow me to block out all the naysay and block out that uh, that that feeling that you get when you look at your record and it's not what you expected it to be, um, especially being an undefeated kickboxing fighter, you know, like um, it, it wasn't what I expected, but I know that I'm, I'm stronger for it. And I know that when I do get that title, I'll be able to keep it just because I've been through so many ups and downs and I've been able to uh, just see my mistakes and, and fix them. You recently made your debut on the broadcast as an analyst. How did you prepare for that? Did Dominic Cruz just give you a crash course at, at Alliance or how did it go? Um, it's pretty funny. Like I, I picked Dom's brain a bit. I picked uh, Karen Bryan and um, Laura Senko. They they were all like really supportive. I've I've, I've uh, you know known those guys for a long time. And uh, and my husband actually was a big help because he would give me this uh, Michael Bisping impersonation when he would uh, relay met, uh, relay uh, just back and forth banter. So we would kind of banter about the fight card and and try to anticipate what would happen. And then I try to roll with the, with the, his silly, like Michael Bisping impersonation comments. And it was pretty fun. So I think, I think all those things helped me uh, just bring my best self forward when I did the broadcast. And I, I got a lot of good, uh, good comments about it. So I'm pretty happy with how I did. <laughs> I mean, uh, we all know Michael Bisping. Was his uh, impersonation on point, or were you like, like, babe, that's not Mike at all? <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty good. Uh, he's Scottish, so uh, you know the British. All the British guys, they they kind of know each other's accents. So it was a pretty good. I, I think it was spot on. He'll have to do it in front of Mike to to get the verdict if it's good or not. <laughs> 
I mean, can we talk about a, a bit of history? Obviously, you know, the first African-American female to headline a UFC event. Um, talk about that and also the fact that you go into it. You talked about you were on a couple downs before. You've never been more popular, female cowboy Cerrone and everything. Just can you describe having that accomplishment at this time in your career? Um, it's it's pretty exciting. Uh, like I said, when I when I fought Andrade, um, I thought it was a big deal because her next fight was going to be a title fight, um, but we weren't co-main event. We weren't we weren't main event. And now that I'm fighting Michelle and it's main event after being uh, my first co-main event with my uh, fight against Gedalia, it's it's just, I can see the growth. I can see how far I've come um, when it comes to just, um, just like the fandom that's attached to me. I can see how far I've come skill-wise. And I think people are finally seeing the value in what I bring to the table and what I bring to uh, the strawweight division in uh, women's MMA. So, so it's it's awesome to see it all finally coming to fruition after so much hard work, after after uh, you know just grinding for so many years and and trying to make a name for myself. I feel like it's finally all happening, and and I couldn't be more excited. Does it hit you? first African-American female to headline the UFC or, you know, is that, does it just not creep into your mind that kind of level of accomplishment or that honor? It's, it's an honor. It really is. And it's, it's hard for me myself to be proud of myself because I'm so hard on myself in, in general. Like I don't want to celebrate just being the main event. I want to celebrate winning the main event. I want to celebrate uh, having the first title shot and winning the first title shot um, as, a, as an African-American woman. So uh, I, my, my goals are so much higher than that, that it's hard to, it's hard to sit back and realize how how big of a deal it is but it is it, it's a big deal and if i was sitting on the sidelines if i was just a fan an mma fan and i saw that i'd be like oh man go ahead girl like get that get that win because you know you rarely see a woman uh a, a black woman uh in in the position that i am in mma and i'm not sure why it's so different for women for black women as it is for black men but um i think it's i think uh, the public is kind of starved for for that demographic to be represented. So I'm hoping to bring more eyes to MMA, bring more fans to MMA, and uh, and yeah, I'm happy to carry the torch. A uh, final one for me, just uh, back to business. What does Michelle Watterson bring as an opponent? Um, Michelle's Michelle's tricky. Um, she she has her hip throw. She has a she has a uh, pretty quick transitions. If she gets to the ground, she's pretty good at like getting to the back fast or, you know, going to an arm bar or, or whatever. She's a good scrambler. Um, so those are the things that I'll be looking for. Just trying to, uh, just trying to hit her more. Just trying to hit her more. Trying to draw out her attacks, draw out that uh, push kick to the knee, uh, all her little things that she tries to do to frustrate people, and making sure that I'm not, I'm I'm pushing the pace and not uh, letting her get ahead of me with her volume. Um, I think I think that's one of the reasons why she usually gets decisions that are close and it's one of the reasons i usually lose decisions that are close is that my volume will be close to my opponents even if my volume is more i'll still lose a close decision so i i just have to up the pace i have to you know be in her face not let off the gas and and just mash her up hey thank you angela good luck thanks we will take our next set of questions from Danny Segura with MMA Junkie. Angie, um, you just mentioned that like, you know, your career seems to be blossoming and you're getting all these opportunities. Um, how does it feel to like finally get the respect that you feel like you deserve? And also, when did you sort of feel like the tide was turning in, in your career? Um, I think after, after my first two, well, um, maybe, maybe back to the Escobar fight, I feel like that was, uh a good reminder to myself of how dangerous i can be in there and how uh, versatile my striking was and 
just the fact that I brought something to the table that a lot of girls in my weight class didn't have. So I think that was one of the first moments. But then after that, going on, uh, getting two finishes in a row, one the one in Mexico City and then the one in uh, North Carolina, um, I, I think that's when people started paying attention and they're like, man, this girl is, this girl is actually something we, we might've written her off a while back, but she's hit, uh, she's hit a good stride. She's, uh, figured herself out. Like she's just going in there and beasting out on people. So after that fight, then I got the call to jump in, um, jump into another fight, uh, in New Zealand. And I only had like, I don't know, like two weeks notice and i think that's when people started picking up on the fact that i was about to have i think six fights in in a calendar year or not a calendar year but 365 days so mm -hmm. that's when people are like oh my god she keeps fighting she keeps fighting so i think um i think just me being as active as i've always wanted to be i think um um, Mick Maynard letting me be that active and uh, just bringing the fight every time I showed up. I, I never missed weight. I never looked slow or tired. Uh, you could never tell that I took the fight on short notice. And that's just been a, a product of my grind. Like I've always been like that. I've always been in the gym, even, even when I've had seven months in between fights, I was in the gym the entire time treating it like a job. And I think for anyone, if if you just keep grinding like that, if you if you treat MMA or if you treat whatever you're doing like a job, even if it's a hobby, if it's uh, just some goal that you that you aren't sure that you're going to accomplish, but you're really passionate about it. Um, if you stay consistent, then you're always going to get ahead. And I feel like that's finally happening. I'm finally seeing the product of uh, all the work that I put in. For sure. And you're in one of the best divisions in the UFC. Um, do you think if, you know, all these opportunities keep keep coming your way, you can become a, a big star in that division, one of the key players, main players at 115 pounds? Oh, yeah, that's that's the main goal. Um, the main goal is to keep fighting, keep winning, um, keep uh, just showing people how good I am and just becoming more of a finisher too i think that's a big goal of mine and after getting those two finishes in a row i'm uh, i know that i can i know that it's it's within my ability in the ufc before i've only been able to really knock out people outside of the ufc but now that i've gotten some finishes inside the ufc that's that's my main goal is to be a finisher to be one of the most dangerous women in in uh, in the strawweight division, and to get the title. So um, so yeah, a win over Michelle is definitely gonna put me up there. Uh, I think my last fight, if it had been a win, it would have put me up there already. So this is just my chance for redemption from that. Yeah, and, and as far as uh, you just mentioned, how like obviously a win here would be very beneficial to your career, but. As far as like like maybe numbers or, or, or names, I mean, beating Michelle Watterson, uh, a veteran of the sport, where, where do you think it'll put you in the division and and uh, what kind of opponents will you be facing after? Um, I'm definitely thinking I'll be facing top five after that. Um, but I, I don't even think that the top five are doing anything right now. Like I know some of them are moving up a weight class, some of them are pregnant, some of them are <laughs> injured. So if there's no top five girls available. I'm calling out the champ. Uh, I think it's fair. I think uh, in just the way the, the strawweight division is looking right now, I think the timing would be good. And if there's someone who is supposed to get the shot before me, I'm definitely willing to fight that person. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it really pissed me off when I, I saw an article about um, Gedalia versus Zhang and Yan. You know, and they're like, oh, the winner of this fight could be uh, the next person to fight for the title. I'm like, that should be me, you know, because I, I felt like I, I beat both of those girls. So if I need to fight again after this one, I'm willing to. But honestly, I, I think a title shot would be fair. For sure. All right, Angie. Well, best of luck this weekend. Uh, looking forward to your fight. We will take our next questions from Damon Martin with MMA Fighting. Hey, Angela. Uh, going back to pre Previous question: When your manager posted that image saying you were the first black woman to headline a card, I, I saw it and I thought, "Wow, that's really awesome! That's really cool!" But 
we are living in a, in a very you know interesting time in our country in terms of the significance of something like that happening right now. Uh, I know you said you don't want to let it you know, weigh on you too much with, you know, you want to be the winner in the main event, but what, what does it, what does it mean to you, the significance of, of this happening at this moment in time? Um, it's, it's big. Uh, and I didn't even realize how big it was until, until he mentioned it to me. And, uh, I think, I think in a time like this, uh, people, people need heroes. People need, uh, someone to look up to, someone to root for. And just the fact that this hasn't happened yet is is indicative of the fact that it is important. You know, like a lot of people will say, why does it matter? Well, if it doesn't matter to you, then that's okay. But it does matter to the fans who see that and they're like, finally, you know, finally we have some representation. Finally, we have a face that's, in the sport that we love that we and we've been waiting for it for so long so um so yeah it's it's really cool to be a part of that um the black lives matters movement is is just uh it, it it's really important and i think it's really important i think people try to um pretend that it's not or or try to call it things that it isn't because it's hard to look at the to look at the violence, you know, it's hard to it's hard to say there's something wrong when you haven't experienced it yourself. And um, and I think uh, the reason it's so important to Black people is because they've all had moments where they felt in danger or they felt like uh, they felt like they weren't being considered as human as their white counterparts. And it's not something that disappeared when Obama got elected. It's not something that um disappeared once cops got cameras on got body cams you know it's it's something that's that's still hurting the community right now and um and i think just with the pandemic going on and uh with with just you know everything just being so divisive right now it's it's really brought it to light and really made people att- pay attention to how hard it how hard the struggles are and and you know the fact that there does need to be some change um so it's it's kind of it's kind of a touchy subject for me you know because i it's i don't know it's like i wish i could do more i wish i wish i i um i wish i could do all the research and figure out ways to make make uh make america a better place and um you know, what actions to take to help get justice for the people who have been uh, um, killed, killed unjustly. And, and, you know, just, it's it's really hard to think of all that. And, um, and the easy thing for me to do is to fight, you know, like, I, like, if, if this is, if this is something that I could do, if, if just carrying that burden into the cage is is something that I can do. I'm I'm happy to do it because a, a lot of times, uh, I think a lot of us feel helpless, you know. And it's and it's um, yeah, it, it's it's just such a it's such a tough subject, and it and it gets under people's skin. But the reason it's so touchy is because it's such an important thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm going off on a tangent, but uh, but yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy just me doing what I what I would be doing no matter what. I'm happy that that can somehow make a change or somehow uh, um, encourage people to keep fighting for what they believe in. Absolutely, absolutely. You talked earlier about, you know, also inspiring people and we talked about representation and you posted a tribute on your Instagram page to Chadwick Boseman when he passed away and, uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, I know you're a big pop culture person like myself. We've talked about this in the past. The how how significant Chadwick was to the pop culture movement in terms of being a, a black man, being Black Panther, and giving kids you know a superhero to look up to, where you know he did the, the, the Captain America, whatever it is, you know, being that representation. I know it's a lot of weight to put on your shoulders, you know, going into a fight, but 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 but, but are you are you proud to, to have that you know be that inspiration for people, be that representation? Because you mentioned you know it's kind of weird that we we're at this point we haven't had a, a black woman headline a UFC card and. and you can be that for people. You can be that representation, that inspiration. 
Yeah, um, I think uh, when he died, I, I, I think like everyone else, I, I started watching a lot of interviews that he had um, talking about um, the significance of uh, when Black Panther came out. And the one that really choked me up was the one when um, he was he was surprised at how important the film was to these two kids who were terminally ill. Um, he was so surprised that it was a, it was that important to them, and and that's kind of like I I would never compare myself to to like him, but uh, when people do reach out and say, hey. Um, my daughter looks up to you. My girlfriend loves you. Um, my, uh, like, I, I hope my daughters can be be as strong as you are. Like when people reach out and say things like that, it it's always it's it's always surprising, but it it just makes me feel so happy that I didn't give up. You know, like it it gives me that extra push when I just want to be like fuck it, you know, <laughs> like, fuck it, this isn't worth it, it's too hard, because fighting is hard, it's really hard, and it's even harder when, when your entire, like, every time I've lost, it's been on the UFC stage, I've never lost outside of the UFC, so having, having that magnifying glass on every, every win, but also every um, failure, it, like, people reaching out to me and saying stuff like that like it's it's so it's so special and it's something that you can't um is is just something that you can't really explain but uh you know representation is such an important thing to so many people and i remember like when i was a kid and and i would always want the black barbie because i'm like yeah that's me or i would always you know, uh, watch Rugrats and get extra excited when Susie was on, you know? Um, so it's it's just like one of those little things where people who aren't starved of it don't realize that they would miss it if they didn't have it, you know? Uh, if, if, uh, if you are, if you're white in America, you've never, you've never felt underrepresented, you know, um, but, but it's it's a thing that's important, um, especially when, uh, especially in times like this, where where you feel like y your people are being treated less than human. So um, so yeah, it's it it's it's so sad. Uh, you, the death of Chadwick Boseman, and and I think uh, I think it it was really, I think it was really crazy. It, how strong he was, the fact that he kept kept all all that to himself, the fact that he was fighting cancer for so long. And um and yeah, it, it's just uh, another sad loss. It's 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 horrible, but um definitely his story is given a lot of people strength, including me, uh just seeing that um you never know who you're inspiring. And just just by going about your day, just by by trying to be the best you that you can be, you never know who's looking at that, and and taking inspiration from that. So so yeah, that's I, I guess that's all I have to say about that. And last thing for me, Angela, we're in a we're in a weird time with uh with you know where we're doing the weigh-ins tomorrow, and you know we're not gonna get the crowd things like that. You are a person who uh always has the best uh weigh-ins the best walkouts things like that i know a little bit of the creativity stamp down with the uh with the uniform and things but anything planned for this uh main event any, any hints you can give us of what you got in, in the works for uh for tomorrow or, or saturday nah I, I gave that up a while ago um you know uh you know who's really great uh suzy um our makeup artist with the ufc she's fighting cancer right now too and she would always hook me up with the with the uh, war paint, with the black black panther war paint and stuff for weigh-ins because we can't really do that much um, with the with the Reebok uniform. Like we can we can maybe wear a wig or or paint our face, but that's about it. So um, so yeah, I'm I'm gonna leave it to the pros. I'll I'll, I'll get back to that stuff when Susie's back and. And working with us, uh, I know she'll pull through, but um, but yeah, nothing planned. Just just gonna stare this girl down and imagine what it's gonna look like when I punch her in the face. 
<laughs> Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much, Angela. That is all the time we have for you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. <laughs>We now welcome UFC featherweight Billy Corintillo. Billy, thank you for the time today, sir. No problem, guys. Thanks for having me. We will take the first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cape Side Press. Hello, Billy. You've gone from the local circuit to now having two UFC victories under your belt. Uh, can you just describe what it's been like to be able to jump up to the big show and have the success you've had so far? Uh, yeah, it's been, um, you know, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I just saw it was uh, the five year anniversary of the ultimate fighter that I was on, uh, you know, a team favor versus McGregor. So it's definitely been a, a lot of hard work I put in and, uh, you know, it finally feels like it's paying off. And uh, it's just a great feeling, man. This is a dream come true to be here and uh, to be 2-0 and and looking to go 3-0. and It's uh, literally a dream come true. What do you take most from those fights before you made it to the UFC that you helped get you ready? Was it moments? Was it just the overall fight experience? What helped you? Yeah, just a lot. A lot of it. Just, just I think a little bit of everything. Um, you know, I knew from the Ultimate Fighter, I, uh, you know, I lost by I was I was getting out muscled. I was getting out grappled, out wrestled. Um, you know, that was a big part of things I needed to work on. Um, it was also at 155 pounds was that lightweight. I kind of realized I was, uh, you know, a pretty small lightweight and that I was able to able to make 145. So changing the weight class, fighting at 145, which is, you know, closer to my, you know, my, my frame and, uh, just getting the experience, you know, being around all those guys, being around Faber and McGregor and, you know, knowing that, you know, I was capable of competing uh, with these guys in the UFC. This is your second fight of the pandemic era. Does it feel familiar to get back there to Vegas in the hotel? Does it feel like deja vu? Yeah, yeah, it really does, man. It uh, it feels like uh, you know, it's it's like we're I'm doing the exact same thing over again. We just have a different opponent. Um, I like the matchup once again, and everything else has been pretty smooth. I got some weight to cut today, and then um, then it's uh, time for time to have some fun. Did you bring anything different? with you to help pass the time at the hotel now that you've had the experience well yeah i gotta cut a few more pounds because last time we, we met at 150 so i got four more pounds to cut so i'm just uh you know i got a little, i got a little bit leaner for this fight um i actually put on a little bit of muscle but um got a little bit leaner for this fight and i'm making sure i have a good smooth cut gotcha final question what's your assessment of kyle nelson as an opponent yeah he's, he's a he's a very tough opponent you know he's uh um, I looked up his fights and, uh, you know, he's a strong striker. He's, uh, you know, he likes to move forward just like me. So I think uh, we're going to start this. I think there's, the reason why we're on the main card is because I think there's going to be some fireworks in this fight. Um, I think it's going to be exciting right from the opening bell, and it's going to be a good way to start off the main card. Hey, thank you, Billy. Good luck. No problem, and thank you. We will take our next question from Damon Martin with MMA Fighting. Billy, uh, you obviously had a crazy couple of months with your fight and then turning around and then what happened with Matt Frivola. Can you kind of give me an idea of what these, uh, what these past couple of months have been like for you in terms of, you know, your, your fighting, but also kind of like the emotions, everything you've gone through. 
Uh, yeah, you know, I kind of, I kind of try to keep my emotions in check because, you know, as, as crazy as it's been for me, it seems like it's been pretty crazy for everyone else too. You know, this is obviously not normal being in a room with a bunch of guys with masks on right now. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, the fight was great. It was a risky fight to take at 150. And then um, to come back, it was unfortunate that I tested positive. I felt, you know, really bad about it. But obviously, it was it was out of my control. And, um, you know, the UFC said, whenever you're ready, let's fight again. And I took the, the, first, the first opportunity they gave me. They offered me Kyle. And, uh, you know, I, I really, you know, this is what I do for a living. I love it. And uh, I'm trying to be a big star in this sport. So I want to just keep fighting and keep, keep getting wins. You, uh, when, when you got diagnosed with COVID-19, I had seen a couple of interviews with you where you said you were asymptomatic. You never really got with that. Did you ever deal with any symptoms or anything? No, no, no real symptoms. You know, I have, uh, I had like a stuffy nose and then for like a couple days, I couldn't, uh, like I couldn't really taste everything as, as you know, normal, but, um, just having the stuffy nose, it didn't even alarm me. Cause you know, I have, I've had allergies. I've, uh, you know, I've had a broken nose before. So I wouldn't even have known that I had anything um, besides that they told me that I was positive. So when I came back, I had to quarantine for a few weeks, but I, I couldn't even tell. I was still able to work out. I was still able to run and uh, I felt completely fine, but I'm just, uh, you know, I'm glad now that I've had a few negative tests now in a row. And hopefully uh, this is the, the last time I have to deal with that. Uh, obviously, your last fight was against uh, kind of a unique character, I guess is the best way to describe him. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Coming back from that, you know, uh, coming into this fight, oh, Kyle's, you know, his own fighter and everything, but, you know, more of a, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to necessarily worry about those weird kind of bizarre things that Spike does with his style. Uh -huh. uh, is it easier or more fun to prepare for an opponent like that, or does it really matter? Yeah, you know, every fight's different. Um, Spike was definitely the most, Spike is definitely the most uh, uh, interesting character I fought. You know, I think he's got a couple of screws loose in his head. Um, I didn't mind getting ready for the Spike fight. You know, he was saying a lot of stuff in these interviews, how he was going to like murder me. And this was like, going to be an easy fight for him, which uh, I thought was kind of ridiculous. But at the end of the day, no matter what my opponent says, I know we're going to get to go out there and fight. So it's, you know, he's going to have to back that up, whatever he said. And uh, I'm I'm really happy to get that for that that last win. But um, overall, I'm just uh, no matter who they give me, me and my team do a really good job breaking these guys down. So I always feel really confident going into these fights. And, and last question, you know, you uh, coming out the contender series, you're on a, a pretty good a pretty good win streak right now. Uh, is right now more about staying busy and just fighting whoever they put in front of you? At what point do you start thinking about, hey, I need top fifteen opponents? Not to say I want to rescue it longer or anything, but like, mm -hmm. where's your mind at in terms of, is it more about activity right now? Or will there be a breaking point where you say, okay, I need to get that top 15 opponents? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely getting close. You know, uh, my first debut fight, uh, Jacob took it on short notice. So that, that was a great, that was a good win for me because he he is a stud. But um, then the spike fight, you know, I'm still, I still need to get through a few of these other uh, guys who are, you know, in the same boat as me climbing up those rankings. Um, but yeah, I definitely uh, feel like, you know, when I get past Kyle that we will step up in competition a little bit and, you know, by next year, definitely looking for ranked opponents because that, you know, obviously it's the ultimate goal is to be a world champion, um, to be on these pay-per-view cards, uh, to get, you know, to get more of a spotlight. So I definitely think I'm heading in that direction, but I got to just keep winning and just keeping, you know, keep making a statement. And that's why I need to go for a finish, uh, you know, Saturday night. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, man. Thanks so much, Billy. That is all the time we had for you, sir. All right, cool. Thank you. Next up, we will be joined by the number eight ranked UFC women's flyweight, Roxanne Modafari.
We are now joined by the number eight ranked UFC women's flyweight, Roxanne Modafferi. Roxanne, thank you for the time today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We will take the first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Hey, Roxanne. People following this fight have probably watched your trash talk about Andrea. How would you describe your, how would you grade yourself, sorry, on your pre-fight buildup? Excellent. It serves its purpose. Well, congratulations. Um, I was wondering, let's say you ever did dislike an opponent, like just, you just have somebody that you just could not bring yourself to be nice to. Mm -hmm. Do you think you might start talking trash or what do you think you would say? I would probably just like walk by and side eye them like that. Probably. I really okay. suck at trash talking or anything like that. So I just kind of do it to amuse myself really. I gotcha, I gotcha. Um, working at a syndicate, uh, you and your teammate Jojo are both trying to get to a title shot. I feel like we haven't seen you guys talk about this, but do you guys have that agreement not to fight each other? Well, we've been kind of rising in the ranks next to each other for a long time. Um, we kind of don't plan to fight unless it's for the title. Uh, that's kind of the understanding we have, and we're just enjoying being teammates. I mean, because you two are both kind of right there, I mean, do you guys talk about it a lot? Do you guys sit there at the gym? It's like, hey, we're going to take over the flyweight division, or is that just something that doesn't come up? Pretty much, you reporter guys ask me that way more than we ever talk about it in the gym. <laughs> every, every interview. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, talking about uh, this fight, obviously it has a lot more attention with the shakeup to the card. I mean, do you feel like a big win here really helps propel you forward in the rankings? Man, I'm trying not to worry too much about the rankings. I know it's an important part of our careers and contributes to who we're matched up against next. But um, I really just want to go out there and smash Andrea and, and get the win. So whatever it takes to do that, I'm going to do it. What's the most different thing about Andrea as an opponent this time compared to the first fight? Uh, I think she's improved a lot um, all around, um, but I have as well. You know, I think I've added a lot more things to my, uh, my arsenal. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this fight's going to play out. Hey, thank you, Roxanne. Good luck. Thank you. We will take the next set of questions from Cote Cruz with the Four to Win podcast. Hi, Andrea. Can you hello? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, Roxanne. Nice talking to you. It's a pleasure. I'm coming from Chile, South America. Oh, thank you for coming all that way. Yeah, I, I didn't move actually, but it's nice to have the technology to talk, right? <laughs> okay. So, how do you feel your game has uh, is comparing to your last inf confrontation with Andrea? How do you feel the layers of knowledge and all the things that you've learned through this process of getting to this rematch how do you feel you you come across as a fighter now i just i'm constantly training that's the whole focus of my life right now um i think i've developed a whole lot in my striking game also my grappling game wrestling um roxy foo everything <laughs> you know um i'm just excited to 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 fight yeah, it was a great video. Who, who came across with that gem of idea of starting this trash talk Roxanne style? Uh, I think it was the comedian Jamie Kilstein, and we made the video together with my friend Charlie, Charlie Hill. That came across awesome. It's a great way to look at you. I You're so fun. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it stuck with me because I, I remember the the stint on the Ultimate Fighter. You were always so positive, so uh, graceful when it comes to talking to your opponent. So it was. I was actually hoping that she's actually going to do it. She's actually going to talk some trash. But there you stand on totally Roxy fashion. And I, I loved it. How do you feel you're going to be in this fight this time around with Andrea? Do you feel that... You're going to go the distance or you're actually looking for the finish this time? I always look to finish the fight. Um, you know, it doesn't always happen, but I always try to do that. Um, you know, I think last my last fight, I, I wanted to go out there and, and show what I could do and, and show that I've improved 
improve myself to myself and to my coaches and fans. But this time, you know, I don't, I don't care about any of that. I just want to go out there and win any way I can. I want to either smash her on the feet or on the ground or wherever in, in the midair. You know, I'm just going to do what it takes to win. That's awesome to hear, Roxy. Bets of luck on your fight, and we'll be in touch. Stay, stay safe. Thank you. We will take the next set of questions from Manabu Takashima with MMA Planet. Erickson. Oh. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Uh, actually, you never say that, but when you fight against the uh, Lauren Murphy, uh, you got an injury, and they, you didn't. You didn't make a you know good show, good prepare the fight, but uh, how how recovery you know your injury and then uh, how you can prepare to this fight? Yes, um, I feel like this camp was better. Um, I have you know recovered a lot. Um, I'm gonna have a great performance. I feel great. I feel awesome. I'm in shape. My body feels great. You know, I had great preparation, so uh, I can't wait. Okay, and also. Everybody you know, to know that the US striking game is a very improved a lot. But uh seems like uh, when you didn't have a good striking, your grappling and your wrestling is a you know, it's like uh, more powerful and now you can you can make a good strike striking game. That's why you lost some balance as uh, you are still one of the best grappler in your division, but how do you think about the balance of this using striking and grappling right now? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have improved, you know, with my striking and I'm going to, so in this fight, I'm going to go and use all of my skills to get mm -hmm. the win, you know, my striking oh, and grappling and, you know, I'm going to control the fight and get a dominant win. Oh, but don't, don't you think about the too much using the uh, boxing right now? Hmm. We shall see. You have to wait and see. <laughs> All right. And uh, please say something to Japanese fans in your Japanese. Okay. Uh, it's more Nihon, Nihon no fan. Oh, and stick with it. I got to say, Master. Cut the car. So stay cut that out. Nihon, you can't die. All right. Thank you so much. You know, so yeah, really hope to see you in, yeah, in Tokyo. Oh, Yokohama. Yes. Thank you. And we will take our next questions from Damon Martin with MMA Fighting. Uh, obviously, you've been a, a stalwart of uh, of the sport for a lot of years, and you know we don't see you know, longevity in this sport is tough. It's not easy to stay, especially where you're a top ranked fighter, you know, for such a long time. What do you feel like has been the key to that for you? Is it your passion for martial arts? Is it just who you are as a person? Because typically we don't see people sitting in the rankings, you know, for, for several years at a time. And you've been kind of that way your entire career. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that evolution is the key to me staying, you know, in the top 10. And uh, I'm seeing that with other veterans like um, Overeem, for example, or other fighters who've been fighting for a really long time. They are like evolving. They've moved camps to a new place where they can be pushed. They're trying to like grow and change. So me too, like uh, my personality and my belief to be a martial artist first has helped me embrace and uh, pursue learning and evolution so that I'm able to keep growing and keep improving and keep staying in the top 10. Is that is that passion a big part of it? I remember when you moved from Japan back to the States and, and did the ultimate fighter and did things to kind of improve yourself. Like, do you feel like that passion is a big part of what has driven you and what has kept you, you know, uh, growing and evolving in this sport? Uh, because it is tough. We, we hear all the time fighters talk about getting burned out and, you know, they, they kind of hit that wall a little bit. Mm, yes, I do have a, a passion for martial arts. I love it. You know, um, people who start fighting to make money and be a champion, they never really get anywhere. But when you love the sport, that really enables you to do it because you love it, you know? So, um, you know, I, I do get burned out if I train too much sometimes, but usually one day off will do it for me. Um, and after my fight, you know, I like to take a week off and then I usually feel like I want to do jujitsu now and then I, I get back into it. 
And, and last question, you know, of course, everyone knows you as a happy warrior. You always keep a very positive attitude. Do you feel like that has helped you, you know, through the ebbs and flows of a career where, you know, you're going to face ups and downs. You're not going to win every fight. Uh, you have to be able to cut back from losses because we do see some people kind of stick with that that loss and that negativity kind of overwhelms them. And you have such a positive attitude. Like, do you feel like that does help you uh, move forward in your career and, and kind of go through those that roller coaster ride that is that is MMA? I think so. You know, they say the mental game is most of the battle, but I think that really refers to um, kind of pushing yourself to train and to, you know, do things you don't necessarily want to do to get the win or to get stronger. Um, thinking positively and encouraging yourself is also very important. You know, um, if, you know, I like to say that if you, if you, even if you train hard, you don't always win, but if you never train hard, you don't believe in yourself, you'll never win. So yeah, keeping a positive attitude is absolutely a key for me. Thank you, Roxy. Thanks so much, Roxanne. Those are all the questions we had for you. Okay, thanks for having me. And next up, we will be joined by the last athlete for the day, UFC featherweight Kyle Nelson. We now welcome UFC featherweight Kyle Nelson. Kyle, thank you for the time, yeah, sir. Thanks a lot for having me. We will take the first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Hey, Kyle. It took three tries, but you finally got that first UFC victory. How much of a relief is it going into this one now that you finally have that first UFC W under your belt? Uh, you know, it feels pretty good. Um, you know, I think it was just about getting my mindset and stuff right um, in the first two. Uh, obviously, the first fight was, was super short notice, so I didn't really have much time to prepare. And then uh, the second fight, I felt like I prepared really well physically, but um, mentally I just wasn't in the right space. And, uh, yeah, for my third UFC fight, I think I had everything dialed in and uh, obviously performed really well for that one. And, um, you know, I've had a year since then basically to keep improving not only physically but mentally, and I feel like I'm only going to be even better now. I mean, you talk about that. Obviously, there were circumstances, you know, the short notice and the first one and everything else. But, you know, two losses, it could be very discouraging for a fighter. I mean, what did you take from those first two fights to help yourself improve? And now you're at this point where you did get the victory. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely a lot from the, the Matt Sales fight. Um, you know, I think I was just a little too over aggressive, uh, trying to maybe be a little too entertaining and uh you know searching for the knockout a little too hard um and then yeah in the polo fight i just kind of let it come to me i just went out and fought uh you know how i trained and how i fought before i got into the ufc and everything came together well um you know in the diego ferreira fight it was more or less um you know we got the call on on three or four days so it was basically just make weight um go in and fight and um but i mean it was my first time fighting in, in front of a big audience there in uh, toronto canada I think there was uh, like 20,000 people. So, you know, I got to experience some of that and, uh, you know, the whole uh, routine, you know, that you go through when you're fighting for the UFC. So that's kind of what I learned from that. How has the training situation changed for yourself since your last fight? I mean, has the pandemic made it easier or harder where you're at personally? Um, overall, it's probably made it easier. 
Um, you know, when the pandemic first hit, um, everything kind of got locked down. So it was more so I just focused on my physical fitness and stuff. But, um, you know, COVID and the pandemic's not too bad where I'm from in Canada. So as things started to open up, um, you know, I was able to get back to training, uh, I think, earlier than a lot of other places and um, continue to improve on everything. And when, uh, you know, the pandemic was going on, there wasn't much else happening. You know, I didn't have my normal errands to, to run around and do and, and normal everyday stuff. So I was able to focus even more on training. Final question. What is your assessment of Billy Quarantilla as an opponent? Uh, I think he's a good opponent. Um, you know, well-rounded, definitely, uh, you know, I think he's, he's his best on the ground. Um, but yeah, I think he's a little more of a survivor, not really a killer. Uh, you know, I don't think he poses a lot of danger to me. I think, um, you know, his best bet is to try and try and take me down and try and ride out a, you know, a boring decision win, but uh, I'm not going to let him do that. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Good luck. Thank you. And we will take our next questions from Gavin Porter with UFC.com. So, man, so uh, you can show this one, Gavin. Yeah. So uh, you're fighting Billy, who's on a pretty good streak. And if you were to get the win over him, do you think that, you know, you could be able to capture some of that momentum that he, he's been building up and uh, the success that he's had in UFC would be a good victory for you? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of what I'm looking to do, you know, kind of steal the hype. Uh, he's got some hype behind him, and, uh, you know, I can I can go in there and extinguish that hype and kind of take it for myself. Um, even when I took that, uh, you know, the short nose fight against Sean Woodson that unfortunately fell through, it was kind of the same game plan. You know, he was he was undefeated and, and coming in on a big tear, and, you know, I was ready to steal that hype. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen, so now we're just going to go ahead and steal all of Billy's hype. When you get that opportunity on the, the main card this time, and when you're opening the main card like this, do you, do you – do you this as an opportunity for you to, you know, kind of get more eyes on you than maybe you have uh, had in the past? Uh, I'm just going to go about it every, like every other fight, um, whether it's on the main card, the prelims, or the main event. Um, you know, I'm going to do the exact same thing. So there's, there's no point in me focusing too much on, on how many viewers there's going to be and how many people are watching. I'm just going to go in and knock them out the same. When you've been away from the Octagon for this whole plus year, what have you missed most about competing? And uh, what, what are you most excited for to get in there and do on Saturday? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, I miss a lot about competing. That's, uh, you know, that's why I train. Uh, that's what keeps me motivated. That's why I'm up every day early to run. Um, so, you know, without that, um, you would almost, you know, the fire actually, you know, grew bigger, um, you know, waiting for another fight. And, and yeah, there was a bit of, a bit of frustration, but, um, you know, I just kept training harder and harder and harder. And uh, I knew when the time did come, I would just be even better. So the improvements I've made in this last year have been uh, amazing, and, and nobody's going to be able to kind of see that coming. So I'm, I'm very excited to get back in there. When you have kind of that frustration and that fire built up, does that kind of mean we're going to see a, an explosive version of this Kyle coming out on that first round? Uh, you're always going to see an explosive version of Kyle. Uh, you know, I come with the power, the speed, the strength, um, you know, and, and if anything lands on Billy, that'll be it. So... I got power in my hands, both my feet, my knees, my elbows. Everything's coming with a lot of heat on it. So Billy's got a lot to be scared about. What does a, a statement victory look like for you? What do you envision your statement being on Saturday? Uh, you know, I would love a one-punch knockout uh, and then just walk away. You know, um, finish them nice and early, get in and out, not get hurt, and uh, be ready to jump on a, another opportunity if something comes up real soon. Perfect, man. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. That is all the time we had for you, sir. Awesome. Thanks a lot. And that concludes the UFC Fight Night Watterson vs. Hill Virtual Media Day. As a reminder, we will be hosting a second Virtual Media Day later today featuring the two main event athletes from UFC 253. <laughs> Beginning with middleweight champion Israel Adesanya at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.30 Pacific Time, followed by number two ranked contender Paulo Costa at 9 p.m. Eastern at 6 p.m. Pacific. We will distribute video and audio downloads from today's events to your emails as soon as they are available. Have a great day, everyone.